feel like uh, I feel like an airline pilot. Uh, you know, they always say this is service to so and so, uh, and if you weren't going there, you're on the wrong plane. But uh, it's too late to deboard at that point. They should announce it before they shut the doors. But you are in uh, the panel on the Texas-Mexico relationship and its troubling decline here in Salon 6 at the 21st Texas Policy Summit. So thank you for joining us uh, here today. My name is Joshua Trevino. I'm the Chief of Intelligence and Research at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. I've had the real privilege of helping to develop, conceive, and pioneer a lot of the, the policy engagement uh, that we're engaged in now with the Texas-Mexico relationship uh, in particular. So I want to cast back into, to introduce this, I want to cast back into the mist of time, which is to say literally to yesterday evening. Uh, some of you saw it. Uh, if you didn't see it, the scenes yesterday uh, were shocking. Several hundred uh, men, uh, male migrants, uh, actually overran this is all on film, overran a Texas Army National Guard position outside of El Paso, Texas, and were only stopped in their rush to the border by an actual physical border barrier. Uh, and so you had the, 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 the appalling scene of, of uh, United States Army position being overrun, something out of Afghanistan in summer 2021. Uh, shocking, except it happened here in Texas on American soil. And you know, we, we come to these scenes, uh, these scenes, by the way, which are incepted and candidly designed by a state cartel synthesis that currently controls uh, the Mexican state. Uh, we come to these scenes in the context of a steadily deteriorating relationship between Texas and Mexico. Um, as the Mexican state increasingly aligns itself with the cartels and the criminals uh, that have uh, metastasized and, uh, there's no word for it, uh, infested Mexican society, uh, Texas has responded. The state of Texas has responded with Operation Lone Star. We've responded with border barrier construction. We've responded with secondary inspections, doing what DC won't, which is linking trade and security in a direct way. And we've responded with legislation like Senate Bill 4 from the 88th legislature, which actually for the first time empowers the state to detain and de facto expel illegal entrants. In response, the rhetoric and the action from Mexican officialdom has become increasingly unhinged. And you can see it whether you're looking at the SRE personnel, whether you're looking at Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president of Mexico, and his, uh, uh, his, his actions and his words. Uh, Texans and the Texas governor are called inhumane, racist. Uh, I laughed out loud yesterday when AMLO called uh, the state of Texas unchristian. Um, uh, and you also see them increasingly working with the government of the United States, the federal government, uh, and the Biden regime, actually, in an effort to uh, attack and suppress Texas's actions in legitimate self-defense. And so, you know, we ourselves have had conversations with Mexican officials in which these Mexican officials have promised essentially to uh, uh, advocate for the illegal population of the United States and weaponize that same population against the state of Texas. This is real and it is something that office holders on the other side of the border genuinely believe. So it's, it's no secret that Texas and Mexico have a fraught history. Obviously, Texas was born in revolution and secession uh, versus the, uh, a Mexican dictatorship. Uh, and yet, nevertheless, uh, the, on the Texan side, the hostility and the enmity that characterized Texas-Mexico relations from 1836 to about 1936 was assumed by everyone here in Texas to be a thing of the past. Cultural exchange, uh, the mere fact of being neighbors, a generally peaceful border, and of course NAFTA in 1994 seemed to usher in a new era of Texas-Mexico relations that would set aside the conflict that characterized uh, the Rio Grande frontier uh, in its first century. Uh, unfortunately, and we have to face reality, it seems like the regime that controls Mexico, the Morena party, uh, AMLO himself and his designated successors, are intent on bringing back the bad old days. And that troubling decline, that intention, and how Texas responds to it is why we're here today. I have with me here uh, three great, I almost said great Americans, but we have, we, we have, we have two great Americans and one great Mexican uh, uh, with us today. Um, uh, Alice Galvan, Glenn Hamer, and uh, Andres Fernandez Martinez. Uh, Alice Galvan is the fellow for U.S.-Mexico relations at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, founder and president of Fundación Patria Unida por un México Valiente. And uh, she's de uh, devoted her professional life to uh, advising legislators in the legal and legislative field, both in the Mexican Congress and Senate, um, holds a law degree and master's in government and public policy from Universidad Panamerica, uh, and is 
essentially a champion of liberty in Mexico in general. So thank you for being with us. Glenn, uh, uh, I think I can call you my friend, uh, Glenn Hamer, uh, president and CEO of the Texas Association of Business, a torchbearer for the business community. Uh, Glenn has a proven track record for success. He's led the TAB team to achieve numerous policy wins, including new economic incentives, community college finance reform, and the establishment of business courts, regulatory consistency, and historic property tax relief. Under Glenn's leadership, TAB has launched an international relations division focusing on furthering the Texas-Mexico relationship as well as the litigation arm, the Texas Freedom Litigation Center. And, and I want to tell you a 15-second anecdote about Glenn. Uh, when, when, when Glenn's uh, uh, assistant, your, your, your EA, uh, called Greg Sindelar and I to set up a discussion of our um, of, of the of TPPF's Mexico work, uh, you know, we thought it was going to be kind of a you know, we're, we thought it was going to be a chamber of commerce, you know, kind of call like guys, you're threatening trade. And the first words out of Glenn's mouth on the call was, "We love the work you're doing." And I thought, man, TAB really gets it. So, so we we are we we're, we're so grateful to have you here. Thank you. And uh, finally, a new friend, uh, Andres uh, Martinez Fernandez from the Heritage Foundation, a senior policy analyst uh, in Latin American affairs. Uh, in this role, uh, Andres leads the Heritage Foundation's work on U.S. policy toward Latin America, conducting research and engaging audiences on topics such as economic development, foreign aid, transnational organized crime, the activities of communist China, and other extra-regional actors. So it's a very small brief that you have to follow. Uh, prior to that, he was at AEI, where he authored numerous reports and publications on U.S. sanctions in Venezuela, transnational organized crime in Mexico and Colombia, and other U.S. Latin America policy issues. Andres received his master's degree in Latin American Studies and International Economics from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and his bachelor's degree in history from, uh, I didn't know this, Florida International University. Very good. So uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists today. I think a good place to start uh, on this is, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of get, get, get at a ground level here. I mean, we're talking about the Texas-Mexico relationship specifically, which occurs in you know, two major contexts, both U.S.-Mexico and then Western Hemisphere in general. And so, uh, you, you know, I think, Alice, maybe you're the right place to start. Tell me a little bit about the place of Texas in the Mexican political psyche. Like, what, what is Texas? You, you, you've talked with, you've told me you've talked with Mexicans before who, who have asked you, don't the Texans hate us? Well... For the government, the name of this panel is correct. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and Morena hates Texas. But let me explain you why. Andres Manuel, as all the socialists and all the dictatorships in Latin America, needs an enemy to fight so they can say the, uh, the citizens, I'm your hero and I'm going to save you. So in these six years, last six years for Andres Manuel López Obrador, he started with the corruption as his enemy, and he said, I'm going to fight for the corruption in Mexico. That was has, he, but that has, has, he, has campaigned. And when he became the president, the corruption is still growing. So he needs to select another enemy. And that new enemy was Texas because of two topics, migration and insecurity. Why? Because Andres Manuel needs organized crime to financial his movement, to control society, and also it's a president that since the beginning said, open borders. And Texas is the only one that really pushed Andres Manuel to close the doors, to close the border, to save security there. So for Andres Manuel, yes, Texas is the new enemy. And Andres Manuel is saying people in Mexico that he is going to save us from the gringos. No? And from, <laughs> yeah, as, as in Venezuela, no? the Yankees. That, are, that want to invite us, no? that want to destroy us. But for soil society in Mexico, Texas and the United States have been, always been our friend, our partners. And all the Mexicans want, again, to be friends of the United States and work with you because we share problems together. And the only way to solution that problems is if we can work again together. And that's the first 
for me, I think that is the most important thing that the next president has to do in October of this year. We have to reconsider our international relationships and we have to start working with, again with the United States and not with China, Iran, Russia and all the Latin American dictatorships as Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is doing right now. Glenn, I want to I want to toss this to you. Actually, same question. Uh, you obviously deal with with uh, Mexican business and, and and also Mexican officialdom, inevitably Mexican society. Yeah. What do you see about the place of Texas and, and and that kind of political psyche writ large? Well, Josh, I want to first thank you for the chance to be here and congratulations on the smashing success of this thank you. of this conference and all of the policy victories that TPPF has achieved and will continue to to achieve. Uh, Here's, here's my, my take, and I, I guess I am just a gringo, uh, but I have always felt uh, warmly received uh, in the different places I've, I've been in Mexico, usually Mexico City. Coming from Arizona, I put a lot of time into the relationship with uh, Sonora. Now, different with Arizona and Sonora because Arizona is a much smaller uh, economy. It's probably about one-fifth the size of Texas. Yeah. So Arizona and Sonora sort of need each other to build stuff. Now, when you on, on the Texas side, Josh, what I would say is uh, through uh, Rolando Pablos, who uh, was uh, spoke... Our, our friend Rolando Pablos, yeah. Our, our friend Rolando, uh, he chairs our international division and our Texas-Mexico effort. And what we focused on is establishing uh, relationships with the leading business groups in Mexico. So we have MOU signed with CCE, and which is like the US Chamber, NAM, and the Business Roundtable wrapped into one in terms of importance and six or seven other major groups. We've also been very active on the sub-national level. And what that means is working with governors like Governor uh, Samuel Garcia, who was out here uh, last uh, week for a South by Southwest interview and a meeting with President Artsel. By the way, it's fun to hang out with a guy who's two million Instagram followers. You feel a lot more popular. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Governor uh, Manolo Jimenez of, uh, of Coahuila, who was just recently elected. These are two young guys, Tech de Monterey. In my opinion, they speak te uh, Texan. And in fact, we had a chance to go to uh, Governor uh, Jimenez uh, through uh, David Zapata, who works for us and has worked uh, for Rolando and, and for Secretary of State. And Josh, if you listened to his speech and you were just sort of blind test tasting it, you would say, hold on, was this given by the governor of Texas? And the reason why, the two areas he focused on, the two areas, security and economic development. So, you know, just the way you wouldn't say that if President Biden thinks uh, uh, in a certain way, that means Governor Abbott thinks a certain way, uh, I would say that there are some very important governors that are bordering the state of Texas that we're uh, developing a very good uh, relationship with. And I agree with the, the point you made is extremely important. We're going to have a new government in Mexico. I can probably guess, I'm not gonna just say it's gonna be a, a woman, it's probably gonna be the same party, but this is a chance to reset things, or at least attempt to, uh, so that uh, we can get back on a positive uh, uh, footing. And my final point is through all of this stuff, which has been real and, and, and upsetting, the trading relationship between Texas and the United, excuse me, Texas and Mexico has increased to a record 285 billion. It increased 50 billion. And now uh, Mexico is our top trading partner because of nearshoring, I would say. Mexico is number one, Canada's two, China's three. And I love this book. For all those in the room, uh, please read this, Shannon K. O'Neill, why? And it, it'll, it'll explain why, you know, sort of my philosophy that we have to, through your work, our work, we have to rebuild these relationships because at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's China versus the United States and we need a strong North America to win. My final point is, uh, in terms of the way this is framed, I'm just gonna say it. I blame the Biden administration uh, much more than I do the Mexican administration for the migration problem. And here's the reason why. You're gonna tell me that 33,000 Chinese migrants are crossing, going to the Darien Gap, crossing through Mexico because this is Mexico's economic development plan. Our asylum standard has been uh, taken advantage of by the cartels and our administration has uh, not responded 
uh, appropriately. So I put more of the blame on, the, on our federal administration for being the big magnet because Mexico, to some extent, is more of a transit uh, country at this point. So they're not saying, hey, we want the whole world to come t through Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this, Glenn, uh, just, to, just to follow up on that, because I think that's an interesting point. I mean, I mean, you, you, you've, you've posited, uh, not, not, to, not to speak for you, but I think no. it's, it's uh, you posited. You'll probably three, be more eloquent than I am, so Three levels, of, yeah, that's, that remains to be seen. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the three levels of relationship, right? There's, there's with the Mexican federal state, there's the subnational entities that you've talked about, so Garcia and Nuevo León and, and, and elsewhere, and then, and then obviously the, the, the business community writ large. So if the, if, if the contention is that Texas needs to focus on the latter two, you know, you know uh, the, the, the Moreno regime, for the sake of this question, let me stipulate that there's no reset with Scheinbaum, although I do want to ask that later on. Sure. But if there's no reset with Scheinbaum, to what extent is it realistic to be able to turn the tide on all the things that are seizing Texans' attention, uh, the invasion issue, insecurity, you know, illegal migration and so on, with just the subnational and business relationships? It, it, it'll be much, much more difficult. And I just want to say that uh, I, I view Governor Abbott as far and away the best governor in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It's why everyone, whether they're in the United States, including this Arizona guy, or from around the world, want to, want to come here. But uh, it is much more difficult to deal with this relationship if we don't have a good relationship with, with the next president. There's no, there's no doubt. But, but regardless, we're going to continue to work with, with the business community and with a great, potentially great emerging governors who speak Texas. And I, and I believe as we speak, I could be wrong about this, so uh, Google and fact check this. I believe right now in the state of Chihuahua, there are signs saying, don't cross into Texas. There are serious penalties. I think that the government of Coila is doing some advertising to say, uh, d don't do it. Okay, okay. Well then, well then let me, and, and Andres, I have not forgotten about your existence yet, but I wanna ask one more question to, uh, to Alice, and then, and then I want you to put this in a regional context. But uh, Alice, uh, what, do you what do you think about the proposition that Texas has an opportunity to reset the relationship when President Claudia Scheinbaum assumes office on October 1st? Well, it's going to be difficult because mm -hmm. uh, at the end, uh, Claudia Sheinbaum represents the same as Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. That's the truth. But I think that we have to work on that. We don't have another option, you know? And we have a, one opportunity there. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is a very popular person in Mexico. Even everything is going wrong security, economy, educational, healthcare system, etc. A lot of people still love Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador because he's a populist. But Claudia Sheinbaum isn't so populist. People really don't like Claudia Sheinbaum. They are gonna vote them because of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and because they are buying people giving becas and programas sociales. But Claudia Becca, Sheinbaum... Becca's is scholarships, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just learned but, that word, so... <laughs> sorry. But Claudia Sheinbaum will have to change some things if she wants to be in the top of the police, you know, and if she wants to do something different from Andres Manuel López Obrador. She only has six years to continue Morena in the government. So it's there when I think some things could change. And as you said, I believe that we can focus a little bit more on the local governments because there are governments at the local level that they want to do different things. For example, I used to work with a senator from Guanajuato and the governor of Guanajuato is like, okay, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, do whatever you want, but we want to be Guanajuato great again. So he opened the doors to businessmen from all over the world and doing the different things as Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. So there is another opportunity. And the other one is civil society. Because civil society don't like Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, don't like Morena because they are stealing our freedom, because we can live safe in our country. And we want to be safe in Mexico. And we want to grow up in Mexico. And we want to be proud of be Mexicans. So there is an opportunity to work with social society, with the businessmen, with the local levers that are not from Morena, and trying to change the things 
with Claudia, knowing that he is not popular as Lope, Andres Manuel López Obrador, and maybe some things could change there. Andres, uh, you know, obviously you, you, you're, you're a Latin Americanist, uh, not, not a Mexicanist, but uh, you know, it's a subset of your, of your larger speciality. The, the, the Mexican state's hostility, and I think it's important that we uh, really are explicit that it's the state, that hostility toward Texas takes place in a larger regional context of an advancing left. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, I think what we've seen uh, in the region, particularly over the past uh, three plus years under the current administration, is a, uh, a shift where the left has made significant gains uh, and those gains have unfortunately been uh, accompanied by policies that are increasingly hostile to uh, the United States national security interests, uh, influence in the region, uh, and, and broader ties uh, within the hemisphere. Uh, and, and that's unfortunately um, a development that we've seen the Biden administration in Washington essentially uh, stand aside and, and uh, welcome, or at the very least, uh, not uh, not push back on, particularly on the, the shifts on policies. We've seen in the case of Brazil, certainly, uh, welcoming of hostile powers, uh, the presence of China, the presence of Iran, even uh, on a military level. Uh, we've seen in Colombia a pushback on counter, uh, counter narcotics uh, policies that have been widely successful there uh, and uh, have seen dramatic losses over the past uh, few years. Uh, and very little pushback from the Biden administration on, on that. And, and I think that's a similar um, uh, dynamic that we're seeing in, in the case of Mexico, in the relationship there, where we have uh, challenges that the Biden administration is, is ignoring. Um, uh, migration is, is certainly a, a top uh, issue there. And the, the fentanyl issue, I think, is, is even... As little progress has, as has been made on migration, I think fentanyl and, and the counter-narcotic situation uh, is, is even more dire and, and uh, concerning and heading in a, in a direction which uh, I think is going to uh, come to uh, a boiling point in, in the near future. So the, the, the broader uh, regional context is unfortunately not much better uh, in, in, in a lot of uh, the Western Hemisphere. There, there are some bright spots there. Uh, you saw the elections in Argentina last year bring a, a very pro-U.S. leader to power, very eager to engage with, with the United States, shifting what was before a very antagonistic government, to say the least. Um, uh, but even there, uh, this is something that the, the U.S. has not seized upon to, to the full potential. Uh, so so it's, I would say the, the situation that we're seeing broadly is, is one of neglect and one that is, uh, is coming to, to a, a boiling point pretty near. And, and you can see that, and I'll wrap up here, you can start to see that in, in some of the crises that have already been uh, boiling over within the region in smaller countries in Ecuador, where uh, narco gangs have basically pushed the, the country to a failed state. Mexican narco gangs, even. That's right, yeah. Mexican uh, narco gangs. And again, this is, this is one of the issues with not pushing back sufficiently on the uh, encroachment of, of transnational organized crime and the policies in Mexico and other countries that have, uh, have allowed them to grow. And, and then Haiti is, is another, the, the most recent. Um, again, these are just, uh, the, the hemisphere is on fire um, and we, we are looking the other way in, in Washington, unfortunately. Is, is uh, and again, I want to make sure I understand you uh, very clearly here, is, is, is U.S. neglect, would U.S. attention and U.S. engagement say that we had, you know, prior to, say, 1990, would that be the keystone of the arch that kept most of this from happening, hypothetically? So I think uh, the engagement that we saw, particularly on countering uh, transnational organized crime, was much more substantial, certainly, than we're seeing right now. And that was uh, very important as far as building a regional consensus uh, around the need to combat these threats uh, and engaging and providing support on those fronts. You, you've seen very little proactive uh, um, efforts by the, the Biden administration on that front. You've seen other uh, priorities pushed within our regional relationship, uh, whether it's climate change, whether it's social issues, uh, abortion rights, a, a lot of these domestic 
uh, democratic uh, far left ideas and policy priorities have really taken uh, a center stage for a lot of our engagement in the region. Alice, what do you see of uh, you know, kind of this phenomenon that Andres is describing, this larger regional context is coming into Mexico and affecting the relations with Texas? Yeah, well, I, I will continue just with a little what you say. Andres Manuel understood very well the position, the geographical position of Mexico. And yes, Latin America is on fire. And they won six years ago the most important country that the left needs to win, Mexico. Because we are so big, because we are the neighbor of the United States, and because we have a lot of money of the, or by the crime, organized crime no? and all the cartels. So Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is a friend of all the Latin American dictatorships because she is part of Foro de Sao Paulo and Grupo de Puebla. And this kind of presidents, because they are not presidents, they are dictatorships, having financial by the international organization and with the biggest enemies of the United States, China, Russia, and Iran. But they have been very intelligent. They don't come to Mexico and say, hey, we're gonna help you, help you against the United States. Here are my arms, Here are, here's my army. No, they understand our needs. So, what is China doing right now in Mexico? Oh, you need money to improve your ports. Okay, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna give you money to improve all the states. Now five of the ports in Mexico are controlled by China. But they are not only giving money. That's what Mexican government thinks they are receiving. But they are start closing in our country to continue pushing back the United States. Yeah. And Texas is the only state in the United States that continue being strong against Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And that's why Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador hates Texas. Biden is the best friend of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador because he could say whatever he want, he could do whatever he want, and Biden is like, what's happening? I don't know. <laughs> that's the truth, sorry, but that's true. When Trump was at the presidency, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, maybe in Mexico could say, no, Trump is wrong. But when he came here, it's like, whatever you say, I'm gonna do that. No? Yeah. So that's why Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador right now has Texas as his enemy and say they are our enemy. They want to uh, destroy our citizens, our migrants, that's against human rights. Oh my God, poor people. And in Mexico right now, everyone is saying, oh my God, what is doing Texas right now? And everybody is with Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador because people don't understand what really is the problem. Because unfortunately, in Mexico, for example, the migration situation is not an issue for the most popular persons. Right, right. Glenn, uh, I, wanna, I wanna circle back to something that you said earlier, talking about uh, Mexico becoming our largest trade partner, which used to be China, now it's Mexico. Um, which, in, in isolation, if we, you, know, you took us back in a time machine 30 years and, and heard that stat and the numbers attached to it, we'd say things are going great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my question to you, uh, and this is, this is stemming from, from Andres and, and Alice and their observations, how much of that growth in trade, you know, Laredo being the largest port now and so on, which has been off and on with LA for some time, uh, how much of that in that nearshoring phenomenon is just driven by PRC firms that have left Guangdong, for example, and come to Nuevo León or come to Sonora or come anywhere else? I don't know. Uh, I, I doubt that that's... Uh, I, I'm sure it's part of it, mm -hmm. but but I, I think that a bigger part of it is the you know the one area where Republicans and Democrats seem to be able to agree in Washington is that China is a big threat to the United States, and yeah. and that's where I think you have this uh, this uh, very well thought out effort to nearshore in all these different industries, semiconductors, consumer electronics. Uh, automobiles. I mean, you'll have a Tesla. We have a Tesla Gigafactory in the Austin area. There will be one uh, very likely in Nuevo Leon. Uh, that is something to watch, Josh. I, I'm not, I don't want to uh, sugarcoat that that's not an issue to watch. Uh, I mean, I think Alice's point about the ports 
And I would just uh, encourage all my friends in Mexico, take a look at the rest of the world, what happens when you sign leases with China. Oh, yeah. Doesn't work out well. But, but I, I think a much bigger part of the nearshoring trend are legitimate uh, uh, U.S.-based, international, non-Chinese companies making the decision that it's much better to put capital into this uh, part of the world. I mean, because whatever, I'll just say this, uh, Mexico, with all of its problems, in my opinion, is in much, much better shape than China. China is dead meat. I mean, if you're a productive person in China, you're trying to get out there. They have a demographic cliff. Their productive society is trying to leave. Their top companies are being devalued by the day. Yeah. Hong Kong is, is gone. So uh, while the situation certainly in Mexico is, is challenging, uh, it, is, it is something where through constructive policies, including a lot that we're working on to have uh, you know, more secure migration. And one additional point I wanted to make is Chairman McCall recently went to Mexico City, and I think it was one of the most productive visits by a federal official to Mexico in a long time. Because one of the things that came out, and my wife says, don't talk uh, sports analogies, but I'm going to, yeah, no, please is that if you, work, if you work, and this is something we should all work on, if, and Alice, maybe I'm off on this, again, just a gringo, but if, if we work on the southern Mexican uh, border with Guadalajara, it's a lot different than on the U.S. border. And McCall's point is if you're, if you're just playing defense at the one-yard line, that usually doesn't work out well. So Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. That, that, that makes sense. So. That deserves applause. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm going to tell my wife that I use yeah, sports right. analogy. This is, this is good. Yeah. So thank you. We should, we should end the panel right here for you. I may but, be sleeping on the sofa. But, but we okay. won't. Uh, uh, I want to ask, uh, because I think we're, uh, Celine, we're relatively close to Q&A, aren't we, at this point? Or, I have 15 minutes before Q&A? Oh, that's not relatively close at all. Well, then I'll ask the big questions. Uh, you know, th th there does seem to, and, 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 and I appreciate and concur with the contention that there's, there's signs of hope, like there's reason for optimism. There's, you know, there's civil society and there's things, there's obvious US policy avenues that can be pursued. There's Texas policy avenues that can be pursued. Uh, but for the moment, uh, we are uh, absolutely caught in what looks like an escalatory spiral. Right, history is contingent. You know, nothing is inevitable. But as 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 matters continue to escalate, whether rhetorically or on the ground, and you continue to see things like what we saw yesterday, National Guard posts being overrun in Texas, uh, and the Mexican state turning up the heat versus Texas, um, you know, where where do we think it goes? Uh, you know, where do where do we where, where do we think it ends? Uh, and and I want to I want to uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Andres, so we can go from from kind of macro uh, and then and, and then on down to more local. Um, but uh, you know, if you had to, if somebody, this is an unfair question to ask a policy person, but given trajectories, if somebody said, I need to know where you think things are gonna be in five years, what's your prediction? Well, that's... And assume you don't get the policy changes you work for. Yeah, uh, well, I appreciate you giving me the easy questions here. Um, <laughs> so I, I think uh, certainly the direction, if we continue on the direction that we have been, uh, without any substantive change, I think we are going to uh, inch closer and closer to a, a more openly uh, hostile relationship on, particularly on migration and security cooperation. Uh, and I, I, I think I, the, the comments on trade and the, all the positives that we've seen there uh, absolutely, the potential there for the future is also very great, but we we need to take a a lesson from what we've seen elsewhere in the world as far as our engagement on trade and how other issues. And I'm thinking on China specifically, we have advanced we advanced greatly as far as trade and openness with China, and the overall relationship has deteriorated greatly despite that closeness. Uh, that's why I think we cannot allow the trade uh, opportunities and optimism around that to, uh, to overshadow and let us uh, ignore the real challenges that, uh, that we're facing. And unfortunately, that's, that's a lot of what we have seen guiding our policies. So if, if we continue on that, 
uh, uh, ignoring these 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 deeper challenges, letting them continue to bubble up, uh, I do see a, a much more worrying, even more worrying than now, um, situation where, you know, the, let's say a scenario we see coming from uh, from the U.S. southwest border. Uh, a movement of, we've already seen people on terrorist watch lists uh, coming through. If something like that uh, ends up in a uh, in a attack, God forbid, in the United States, um, uh, that will, uh, again, concentrate the mind and the, the focus of Washington in a way that it has not done so far uh, and, and will yeah. overnight dramatically shift the relationship. Glenn? I agree. I mean, I think for the business community, we absolutely have to realize that immigration is tied with trade. It's and and not just say, well, we have all these rosy trade numbers, so we're going to ignore migration. And your point uh, is right. I mean, there are clearly some bad actors, terrible actors that have entered the United States illegally. And, you know, we saw the tragic case in Georgia. That's that's real. That's not made up news and the point what uh, FBI Director Christopher Ray said in terms of some people with terrorist backgrounds uh, and his concern uh, that's a real one you know what you know so I, I I think you know with Governor Abbott when you take a look at between ports of entry you know I'm trying to get my mind around why anyone should ever be entering the United States between a port of entry we have a lot of ports of entry so if you have a legal valid uh, reason to come in the United States, unless, like me, you have a terrible sense of direction, uh, go through a port of entry and, ma and make your case. Because what, what would the state of Texas do if, if there were you know, a bunch of people, let's say, from the Middle East that don't hold our values that wanted to come into the United States? And my, and my final point on this is that it is an awesome thing. It is a big advantage for the United States that the best and the brightest and the hardest working people my wife's an immigrant from Israel, uh, want to come in and work here. But since apparently the entire world wants to come here, and, and we do need more workers, it has to be the United States policymakers that determines who comes in, period. Yeah. Alice, uh, what do you think? Where are we headed on this current trajectory? Okay. I'm going to say something more about that. It used to be a program from the OIT for, uh, in, with the United States and Mexico. Now it's only still within in Canada, this program, from a special people who came from a certain time in the United States to work in certain zones and certain places. So they select the people, the embassy, the United States embassy, is the embassy with the Mexican state embassy, selected the people, they say we need more farmers. So they select the people, they came to the United States legally, they work here, and then they have to return to Mexico if they want to return to the United States to work again. That's an example of how the United States and Mexico could work together in Migrant Legacy and to select who can came to work here, honest people. Note the not honest people that right now is crossing the, the border, no? The big, big problem that we have in security and migration, and they work together, and they vote together, no? The problem in Mexico for several years is that the government believe that we have to work with the cartels like, we don't see you, you do whatever you want to do, don't uh, push me back, no, don't attack my people, and that's why cartels are growing in Mexico so fast. Worst with this government that they are allies, that they work together, it's more difficult to destroy this organized crime. But there is a solution. We need politicians with willingness to attack the organized crime. Not to work like, I don't gonna see you, or we can talk and make a pact of peace. We have to confront them. With all the strategy, and with all the force that we have, and with the United States. We need you to do that. Great. Hypothetical, uh, another hypothetical. Keep throwing these at you. 
um, but they're so useful in illuminating kind of the, 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 the contours of what's happening and, and the thought uh, that's taking place on it, which is, which is considered and profound uh, in the case of the three of you. Uh, assume that you've been invited into Governor Abbott's office and he wants you to tell him the one singular policy change that he or the Texas legislature can make for the state of Texas to do vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with Mexico. What's the one policy that you pick? Andres, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, uh, I think, and this this is maybe not so much a policy change that he can do as uh, much as uh, something that the courts need to allow him to do, uh, but it's to take action to secure the border. Um, now, obviously, the, there, are, there are legal processes going on with, with respect to the, the ability to, to do that uh, fully, but I, I think that is, again, um, it's a prerequisite for putting this relationship on the right path. And, and absent that, um, we're, we're going to see that continued deterioration that we've been seeing. Okay. Glenn? I would say a couple things. One, uh, uh, you have a really good framework. Uh, if you recall, the, it was about a year or so ago the governor signed four MOUs on b security and economic development with the four border governors. Yes. And I, I love, because one of the things I've learned in my three years in, in, in Texas, it's not a state, it's a country. And when- Amen. It is. And, and assimilated. We, very good. Yeah, well, and when you look at what the governor just did with the U.K., whose economy, uh, the U.K., equals Canada and Mexico's combined, uh, I, I, I might just take a look and see for ways to refresh that. Again, I really like what uh, the Coahuila uh, governor has done to really publicize everything that's going on in, in Texas. And I also think that uh, Governor Abbott's voice uh, for the next president is going to be very, very... Uh, important. He, he uh, Texas has obviously done more on border security uh, than any state. It's obviously done more uh, than, than the federal government. So I, I you know, I, I think once again, Texas is, is, is leading the way. And, and Josh, you know, you, you asked, you started and you asked, how am I received when I'm in Mexico, wherever I'm in Mexico? Yeah. And Al, you know what's interesting to me is a lot of times, almost, not a lot of times, every time I'm with business people, you know what they say? We, we love Texas. We have a home in the woodlands. We want to invest, seriously, yep. we want to invest in Texas. So I think one of the things we could continue to do for, with Governor Abbott, I would say, uh, let's get all the dollars, we all due respect, let's get all the dollars we can from our friends in Mexico that want to invest in the best place in the world for capital and bring it to Texas. And, and, and one of the guys who has a home in, the, in, in greater Metro Houston is actually the president of Mexico who set up his son there. Right, so which which tells you something, Alice. What's your one Texas policy that you'd pick? Joshua, I'm not going to talk about a policy, because I think you are doing everything okay that you need to to strong your your secure frontier. That is the biggest issue, no migration and the secure frontier. I think that what you need to do is to improve the narrative of your policies in Mexico, because Andres Manuel is working with the narrative. So. When you say we want our secure, our frontier secure, Andres Manuel says, Texas is against all the Mexican migrants. And that's what people say in Mexico. And that's why all the people in Mexico right now hates Texas and takes just the government. And I told yesterday, Humberto, if the Mexicans were two years here hearing Abbott, they will say, oh my God, she's right. She is, he is doing what he needs to do, and we want also in Mexico. So maybe I will, I will say to them, you have to understand that Andres Manuel is working with a narrative, and you have to work on the narrative also in Mexico to understand that you are not our enemies. You want to be safe, the same as Mexico wants. Yeah. Thanks to all three of you. I'm afraid the correct answer is that Texas needs to get back the Alamo flag that's currently in the History Museum in Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, uh, can we have one more round of applause for our panelists, please?
We're going to go into a Q&A now, open audience Q&A. So we've got uh, my colleague with uh, Sam with a mic. So one, what, one thing before, before you give the mic to anybody, uh, Sam, uh, ask a question in one sentence, if you can, that ends with a question mark. So please, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mario Loyola Heritage Foundation, formerly TPPF, uh, comma, and I will try to ask in one sentence a question that may have many dependent clauses, semicolon. <laughs> Uh, to it, um, uh, it has always seemed to me, or I've worked on these issues for s some years, uh, and it seemed to me that there are two big regulatory failures in the United States that have created black markets in t two different sectors of the U.S. economy that are enormously destabilizing to Mexico. They are, uh, first of all, the, the drug laws create a huge black market in drugs uh, that have led to the formation of these enormous cartels that are militarized cartels. And second of all, the lack of uh, universal employment verification, or E-Verify, is something that Josh and I have debated over the years, uh, creates uh, a huge employment sanctuary for illegal, Im illegal labor. I mean, Texas is like an enormous illegal employment sanctuary um, at a state level because of the lack of E-Verify. And so that's enormously destabilizing because it, it helps incentivize this enormous illegal migration. And I, it's, I believe that both of these black markets create such huge incentives that they will overwhelm any border security measure. Please discuss, question mark. <laughs> Glenn, I want you to uh, take this one first. Well, we have over 100,000 Americans tragically perishing from drug overdoses uh, each year, 70,000 uh, from fentanyl, I believe. So uh, I, I, you're not going to ever get me to say we should be relaxing uh, drug laws. Uh, working closer with Mexico, absolutely. Uh, they, need, they need to do more, particularly with the precursors coming in from China. Uh, in terms of uh, E-Verify, you know, I, I came from Arizona uh, where uh, Arizona d d has done mandatory E-Verify. I think federal contractors do mandatory E-Verify. Uh, I was at the Arizona Chamber when that went on, and, it, and if you have all my, unfortunately, I think Google has my quotes. I said, of course, that'll never work. The federal government has never succeeded in scaling up a regulatory program. Uh, but I'm going to say the Obama administration, uh, they were competent, and they did, and they worked with the business community so that uh, people knew how to use the E-Verify program. And, and in different states have done that with different levels of, of exemptions. I think ideally you would, on the federal side, have some sort of E-Verify paired with legal pathways and all of these areas where we need workers. I mean, if we had 100 bucks an hour, 100 bucks an hour, would any of your kids pick lettuce? 200, 300, the answer is no. So we need labor in certain areas, uh, period. And, but but E-Verify, in my opinion, should be paired with legal pathways. And I also think, you know, you mentioned something interesting about a program. I do think we should be looking at the TN visas, the NAFTA visas, 60 or so categories. It hasn't been updated in a while. It was part of NAFTA. It was continued through USMCA. And maybe there are some areas that are, that are worth looking at, like child care, elder age care as I get older, you know, that maybe those areas could be expanded where we have nice legal uh, flows coming in and out, a pair for older people. I don't know. Alice or Andres, do you want to chime in on that? Or no? Go ahead. On, on the security uh, front, I, I mean, I think I, I agree with Glenn. I, I think the the challenges that we've seen on the security front have uh, increased on drugs and overdoses, the flow, the sizes of the transnational criminal organizations in Mexico. They've increased as we've seen in the United States limited, uh, albeit, but certainly a direction that is towards reducing the harshness of penalties uh, and and even in, in some parts of the country, uh, um, uh, much more permissive policies. And, and you've seen there on the West Coast in, in Oregon, uh, those policies being reversed 
already um, because because of the, the consequences uh, that I think were clear from the beginning, but they're they're now experiencing. So I, I think those I, I, I don't I also don't know that uh, I don't think that we can uh, that we cannot combat these threats without uh, without creating a space of openness for uh, the formal, a formalized drug trade uh, or, or consumption in the United States. I, we, we've seen, again, the situation uh, in the past was, was not great, but we did not have the level of, uh, of the challenge that we're seeing today as far as the scope of transnational organized crime uh, and the, the number of uh, uh, of deaths that we're seeing in the United States. So I, I think that it is something that we can make progress on uh, without, without necessarily opening up the space to, to legal uh, drug trade. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, the only thing I'll add, uh, and, and Mario is, is painfully familiar with my views, uh, but I think it's worth stating for the audience, I, I don't believe that the existence of Mexican criminal cartels uh, is really fundamentally premised on the existence of a black market. I think, uh, I think it's ultimately a phenomenon of the breakdown of the Mexican state. Uh, and the civil society aspects that go with that. Uh, and so the, to me, the experiment with cannabis legalization in the United States, which uh, to my mind is horrifically misconceived, uh, has, has demonstrated that to a great degree. I wanna, I wanna get as many questions in as we can, so please go ahead. Uh, Justice Worthen, can, can we ju Justice Worthen up here at the front? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Josh. Uh, my question is for uh, Alice uh, and uh, Andres. Um, you know, the administrations of President uh, Trump and President Obrador uh, overlapped for uh, for two plus years. What was the relationship between those two presidents? Uh, I'll go first, and then Alice. Uh, I so it was it was complicated, um, but uh, I would say on a uh, top level, uh, it was it was more functional than it was than it is now, certainly, uh, and that's a that's a low bar. But um, the, the engagement that we saw, I think we saw between Presidents Trump and, and uh, López Obrador uh, a level of uh, alignment on uh, the ideas of nationalism, the ideas of uh, their, uh, their personalities uh, and, and their, their bases. Uh, I think you saw a lot of, uh, of, of synergies there, uh, which, which helped to on the issues of migration, for example, secure pretty significant gains with uh, with with agreements uh, such as Remain in Mexico, uh, even on the the narco trafficking, which I think there uh, I, I we we needed to have pressed more. But even there, uh, certainly compared to what we've seen over the past uh, three plus years, uh, the situation and, and the progress was much more significant. Um, uh, but. Uh, it's worth noting, I, I, I think part of that relationship and those benefits, I think, did rely on that kind of personal level connection that we had between President Trump and President López Obrador. If we see President Trump return, he's not going to have uh, uh, President López Obrador as a, as a counterpart. I think uh, Claudia Scheinbaum is a very different politician, uh, and, and I don't think they're going to have that kind of... Uh, uh, relationship uh, and, and alignment. I don't know. Alicia. Yeah, I, I think that the relation that has uh, Trump and, and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has a hypo hypocrita? Hypocrita? hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Yes. No? Andres Manuel here is in light up with Trump, and in Mexico, Andres Manuel is against Trump. But there's one big difference. Trump respect the rule of law. And Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador knows that. So that's why at the end, Morena has been a better relation with Trump because they know that Trump could uh, improve against our government, not as Biden. Biden is no, doing nothing against Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, against all the socialism. We can see that in Venezuela. In Venezuela, it was the same. In Venezuela, could be a little possible possibility to change things when Trump was in the administration. Right with Biden, everything is changing. So the same is in Mexico. Any other questions? 
Uh, pick somebody who looks interesting, Sam. So, <laughs> or, or near. I'll try to ask an interesting question. Uh, I just saw Mexico in the title, and I just assumed that we would be talking about all their great food, uh, beautiful women, beautiful beaches. Uh, it's my way of this saying is, this that is a different conference. It, so. it's, <laughs> it's it's my way of saying that uh, I'm much more optimistic uh, on Mexico. Uh, a lot of Texans love traveling to Mexico. Uh, it's, and it really seems like we're overthinking uh, this. I think the greatest way to have a good relationship with your neighbor uh, is respect their sovereignty, just as we would expect any country to expect our own sovereignty. So, uh, Josh, my question is for you. Uh, I, I wonder where your interest uh, in Mexico came from and uh, the TPPF as a whole. All right. Well, my interest comes from the fact that I am half Mexican and I'm from South Texas. And I can elaborate on that at length. So... If you have eight hours, please settle in, because I have 300 years of history to share with you. But uh, no, that, 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 that's the source of my interest. The source of the foundation's interest uh, actually is an outgrowth of our work in immigration policy. You know, we formally became engaged in immigration policy in 2019. We quickly realized that it needed to center upon border security. And then coming out of that, uh, you know, we, we came to understand in an organic process that there is no border security if you're only focusing on the north side of the border. You know, Texas can do and must do everything it needs to do, and we support a sweeping range of Texas actions, as we do, you know, the, the maximization of federal power at the border. But that is insufficient to itself. Uh, I want to comment on one thing about sovereignty. We agree. Our, you know, we've said this consistently, that our goal is a strong, to the extent, you know, and, and we can't change Mexico. We don't have that in our power. What we can do is we can be friends to friends of liberty in Mexico, Mexicans who can change Mexico. But our ideal would be a strong, sovereign, and secure Mexico. Strong Mexican state that controlled 100% of Mexican territory. It doesn't right now. The Mexican state controls maybe 60 to 65% of its own territory. And the portion that it cedes, the 35 to 45%, it does so by choice. You must understand that. The state has not been pushed out of its own sovereignty. It has acquiesced to the diminishment of its own sovereignty. So Mexico has obligations to its neighbors under international law, under common practice, just as every nation does. The United States has an obligation not to allow the United States to be used as a base for the invasion of Canada, of Mexico, or of any other nation that we, that, that we border. Mexico has the same obligations to us. And we, in the United States and in Texas, must act when our neighbors fail to meet those obligations. Period. Next question. But this gentleman's had his hand up in the corner with the glasses. Sorry, you seem been very diligent. Uh, I think my question mainly goes to do with uh, the cartels. I'm just wondering with the rise of the cartels, and I don't. I think we haven't really talked about Bocchielli's model, but I was wondering if would y'all decide to take civil liberties away for quote unquote more security in Mexico as a result, like of attacking the cartels more? Like, what, what would be your opinion with that? This is properly answered by a Mexican national, so please. We want to attack the cartels. But they are using, their cartels are working with society because they are using poverty. So they understand that people need money to live. And many, many people in Mexico right now don't have a work. So the cartels are giving their work and money, and people get it in because they need to eat, and they need to live. Even they know that working with the cartels means that they are gonna live three years or five years. That's terrible, but that's what is happening in Mexico. So that's why we believe we need to improve, we need to invest in education in our country. We need to be with the youngest people in the country to change these kind of things. We have time for one more question, I believe, uh, up front right here. Sorry, go ahead. Do we have time for one more or is it two more? You have 15 what? Oh, I have 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we always have 15 minutes. <laughs> Well, it's just about, okay, well then, well then let's, let, let's do your questions. Uh, I'll, I'll extend to two sentences per question. Please, go ahead. Thank yeah. you. So we've been seeing what's been happening in El Salvador where the country has kind of done a full 180. It used to be one of the most dangerous countries in Central America, and now it's one of the safest. 
and I was wondering if you could get somebody in power in Mexico that has the same kind of mindset as the president of El Salvador, could Mexico also have that same 180 with, you know, they, they have a very strong sense on cartels, they've been destroying cartel imagery, they've been having really harsh and overcrowded prisons, and would that work for Mexico or is there a different solution? It could work if we have a policy with this willingness to attack and to end organized crime in our country, but it's different because Salvador is like this and Mexico is like this. Mm -hmm. To understand Mexico is like another continent. It's very different what you live in Monterrey, in the north, and what people live in the south, in Oaxaca, in Chiapas, and what we live in the ZMX, in the capital. So it's going to be not that easy to do. But what we need is someone with a willingness to attack and to end the organized crime. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, let's get Catherine over here. Thank you. Uh -oh. um, Texas motto being friendship, looking beyond an MOU. Do you see a path forward for Texas to work better as in a regional alliance with other states on this issue or anything? Other, other, other American states, other U.S. states? States. You mean? Okay. Uh, Glenn, I'm going to pitch that to you. It's easier to work with Nueva Leon than California. Uh, <laughs> uh, Arizona, possibly a lot of, uh, coming from Arizona, a lot of, lot of sort of similar issues uh, on, on the border and the, and the possibilities in terms of building goods together. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I, I really think that uh, it, it, Texas is going to have to lead, lead the way. I just think our border, it's over half of the border, uh, and, and I'll just give a couple of stats. Uh, uh, David Zapata always gives me the statistics. So the trade between Mexico and Arizona, I worked so hard on that for so many years, uh, $17 billion. And David Zapata would say, uh, that's cute. The trade between uh, Eagle Pass and Mexico that flows through is 34 billion. Eagle Pass is 20,000 people. It's, you know, the trade between Mexico and, and Texas is just so massive. 81% of the goods that come from rail or, or uh, truck that come into the United States, about 450 billion, according to a recent Wall Street Journal story, come through Texas. So Texas is more or less the, the, the border. And, you know, I think we could build different, uh, we could get different states engaged in what we're doing, but I don't see uh, a dance partner even close to our uh, weight. Any other questions? All right, go ahead. Uh, gentleman at the back right there next to you, Sam. Thanks. So... Americans, Texans have a lot of partnerships and relationships with Mexico already in, in the business sector, as you just spoke. Um, Mexico electricity is going at an all-time low in cost because more natural gas from Texas is flowing to Mexico, making it cheaper, more effective. You're having a larger middle class in Mexico now than ever before. How do we communicate the importance of ensuring that us as Americans want to have a strong Mexico, want to have a nation that can find different jobs instead of finding a job with the cartels? How do we communicate that, that we want better for them because if they are better, we'll be better and our relationship is better? Contact the White House and tell them not to pause uh, liquid natural gas and other destructive energy policies. I would, I would, and I'm serious. I would start there, and that's, and that's why I'm saying that a lot of this is, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to. I, I know the title of, of of this talk, but I do think a lot of the problems stem from uh, a, a weak administration. Even, even, you know, and and here we have two two experts. I mean, take a look at Venezuela. A quarter of the country has emptied out. How about Nicaragua using visa-free travel to play games with our uh, situation on immigration? Colombia, a very hostile government. Uh, Panama may be friendlier, but can certainly do more. And I think the ne I think that the next administration has to lean in these countries uh, harder. I mean, we could, you could talk about the cartels, and the, those are those are bad bad guys. But 
but why are we allowing Nicaragua and other countries to play games with who's flowing to the United States? I, I, I don't understand that. There's a narrative question in there, too. If, uh, tell me if I'm misinterpreting you, but uh, asking about, uh, about how the narrative changes inside of Mexico. Is that one of the things you're getting? Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that, Alice? I mean, how can, how can Americans who wish Mexico well, want a strong Mexico, want a prosperous Mexico, change the narrative in Mexico right now? You have to say it as you did it. I know that both countries have electoral years and our candidates will use his narrative to win votes. You here in the United States and Andre, Claudia and Maureen, Andres Manuel in Mexico. But you have to make a special narrative from the Mexicans that live here and from the Mexican in our country. You have to be clear. It's just like that. Have to not only said the yes before law is against immigrants. Okay, but what kind of immigrants? And why are you doing that? And why this law could support also the Mexican politics? Uh, next question, this gentleman over here uh, in, in, in the corner up front, if you don't mind. Thanks a lot. Um, Tom Dance with Heritage Foundation. Uh, question kind of picking up on what Alicia was just answering and Josh, your question about changing the narrative in Mexico. I'm wondering is um, one of the things that we see here is if, if we don't spend a lot of time on in Spanish language media, but sometimes you turn, tune in and you listen to it for a little bit and you're like, oh my God, what are they talking about? But the way, you know, Telemundo, Univision, like portray conservatives in the US, in our country, I'm wondering, in Mexico, are there voices that are kind of helping them, the population, to understand, like a voice of Texas, you know, a voice of America? Is there a voice of Texas where the average citizen can tune in to kind of get more of our point of view, especially a conservative Texas point of view? I, I have an answer, but I want you to go first, actually, because go ahead. Unfortunately, not. All the media in Mexico is with the Democrats. All the media in Mexico are against the Republicans, and all the media in Mexico are against uh, Texas right now. But we are working in Patria Unida with a special media and if message is clear to the people. No, we have to work on that. That's one of the biggest problem in Mexico. We don't have a, a conservative media. No, so they said only what they need to say. We have an ally in ADN 40, Carlos Mota, that is the, uh, the only periodist that really speaks the, the truth and that is saying what is need to say. But one in all the country. I don't know, I'm sure you have copies of Jacobin Magazine laying around at the Heritage Foundation, just well, well thumbed. Uh, uh, in, in, in the latest Jacobin, I'm gonna spare you the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the trouble of reading it. Liz Jacobin, there's a hilarious article about how to save uh, the how to save journalism in the United States. This is true. And the Jacobin prescription is that they should essentially make J school free and they should deliver government tax subsidies to all publications in the United States. And therefore, uh, you know, that's this is the defense of the First Amendment. Uh, which I mean we're laughing, right? Like, you know, I feel like the scene with De Niro, like you're laughing. Like they're subsidizing journalists and you're laughing. Uh, that's actually how it works in Mexico. All the publications get true, right? Uh, they, I mean, they, 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 they all actually receive government subsidies, and so and so they all tow the government line. And this is even true for a publication that you know for for many years uh, I actually had a very positive relationship with uh, Reforma, which is sort of the um, I wouldn't say it was the Wall Street Journal of Mexico, but it was a, it was a center right business yeah. oriented publication. Uh, and what was interesting to me is that is that for for, for nearly a decade, uh, when I'd go to Mexico City, one of the things I would do is I would sit down with the editorial board uh, at Reforma or whoever could attend, and we would sit and have a nice lunch. And their offices are beautiful, by the way, so it was no hardship to go. But uh, but uh, I interestingly enough, we have not heard a word from them, uh, and we haven't gotten our emails returned from them since year two of AMLO. Uh, and that's all changed. And so it is, it is a captive press. One of the reasons that we established this double legal alliance that we're working with Patria Unida on and TPPF is engaging in a, a sort of capacity building in Mexico um, uh, with Mexican you know, fighters for liberty is actually because there's a need to create these alternative channels uh, and figure out both content and distribution um, in, that, uh, in that vein. So other questions? Other questions? Sir, you've been very patient up front here, so thank you. 
Hey, Matt with Chairman Guillen's office. I'm actually a recovering economic developer from the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so I wanted to bring this back to the conversation about the local levels and potential opportunity to, for, for relationship at the local level. Understanding that Mexico is very much of a top-down society, I've seen AMLO influence local governments moderate and work with local business community to find solutions, bilateral solutions, on the Texas-Mexico, Texas Tamaulipas border primarily. Is there any hope that that type of seed can grow into a grassroots movement in Mexico which will bring you know, normality back to the Mexican situation in light of the change of administration in Mexico? I want to say yes, but the truth is that it's not gonna change in a year. That's reality. But we have to work one day, one by day. <laughs> uh, you have a question. You've been so patient. Go ahead. Sorry. I have also been waiting patiently. Thank you for yes. everything. Yes, you have. No, no, you have. You have. It's true. I can verify. <laughs> Thank you all for what you do on this issue. It's very important. Um, Thomas McGregor, chair of the Subcommittee on Cartel and Human Trafficking for the Texas Young Republicans. So I submitted this panel to our subcommittee as actually some, for some questions. And one of the main questions that came up is, how do you think a fortified or not fortified relationship between the two countries will either help or hinder the entrance of Chinese spies? What do you mean by a fortified relationship? Like if we fortify with the next election, there's more of a fortified relationship, or if it weakens after the election, Oh, if the relationship is stronger? Yeah. But okay. Yeah, you don't mean the building of fortifications. Uh, oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Anybody want to... Uh, Glenn? Andres? Sure. I'll, uh, so I, I, on the entrance of... Uh, I, and I'll expand this out to just extra hemispheric, uh, but China is certainly... You know, it was, it, was, uh, it was not too long ago, I think it was last year, that um, Mexico had invited uh, Russians and Chinese to march... In their in their national parade and military parade, we we saw we've seen this kind of welcoming of these this presence and uh, uh, far far less uh, far removed from a uh, an active effort to root them out on part of the uh, of the Mexicans. Uh, so I think that is um, that is a, a major issue. I as far as whether or not uh, a strengthening of the relationship would uh, would help in in confronting that challenge. Uh, hopefully, I, I think there are just so many issues within the relationship that, um, and unfortunately, Washington has uh, been pretty poor about pushing multiple issues at once. Uh, you've seen that with the, the issue of migration and the issue of uh, fentanyl you, and trade. Uh, it's, it's one of the three that Washington um, does puts any energy behind. Uh, in, in other co contexts within the region, China is, is top of mind as far as our engagement, uh, uh, but that hasn't been the case in Mexico, in large part because of these other uh, very, very prominent issues. All right, any other questions? Ma'am, you have a question, go ahead. It was actually you talking about Russia and China that sparked this question because I just remembered um, BRICS and you know how they are trying to form that type of currency and I wanted to know how likely is Mexico going to try to join that coalition? Do you think it's dying? Do you think it's strengthening? How does your president feel about it? Uh, I think this is an Andres question first and then Alice, you can go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the BRICS, uh, I'll speak to BRICS in general, uh, I think it's a it's a weakening uh, entity, uh, and and you saw the withdrawal, uh, notably of Argentina, which was going to join, and then recently, uh, after the new president uh, withdrew from that process, and, and they're they're expanding it out to to countries that I, I think is in a way that's kind of a desperation uh, uh, to reinvigorate that organization. Um, I, I would be very surprised if you see, and I'll let her speak, Alicia, speak to this. But I would, I would be surprised to see Mexico uh, uh, express interest even in in uh, joining that, much less take the actual steps to do that. But. Any thoughts on BRICS, Alice? I agree with with Glenn, but I also said that these new relations with China with Russia 
are only at the top of the federal government. People haven't seen that yet. No, they didn't know that. Until two years ago, that the government starts to uh, presume his new relations, no? and they invited to uh, the pride to the China and the Russian armies and not the United States. That's why Mexican start like say, okay, what's happening here? So there is another point for us. We have to work on that and to, we have to communicate that and the risk that for Mexico uh, start to, to being China in our country and Russia in our country. China with money and Russia with intelligence. Okay, uh, I actually do have the correct time this time, so we really do have time for one more question. Uh, any, any last question? Yeah, well, I'll talk to you for 15 minutes after this. Any, any final questions? No? Well, oh, oh yeah, Bernie, we got one final question. Go ahead, please. I have one question. You mentioned the likelihood. Uh, okay, I'll start over again. Um, you mentioned the, the unlikelihood of um, uh, Mexico joining the BRICS. Is there anything within the... Um, USMCA <clears throat> that could discourage them from doing that? <clears throat> and do any of you know of any other levers that the United States can use, not necessarily this current administration, which doesn't appear to be doing too much that's constructive on this subject, but another administration to very quickly reverse the damages that have been done by this administration to a, a sensible relationship with, with Mexico. I'll, I'll take a first crack. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, um, so I, I think there, there are certainly levers that we can use. And it's uh, at, at the top level, it's, it's again linking our economic relationship with, with our broader interests. Uh, so in this case, uh, closeness with, with a China uh, aligned uh, uh, order and I think we would see certainly you know what one of the one of the levers that was being explored under the first Trump administration didn't really get um, explored too deeply but has to do with remittances um, which is just a vital flow for Mexico uh, of, of hard currency and and uh, is is a major part of the economy it's the second largest source of income behind the um, oil. Um, so it, we, we have uh, a huge uh, a huge lever there, um, as well as just in our in our broader relationship. We also have this review process now with USMCA, um, where uh, I, th I believe in 2026 is, is the, the next one, uh, and and these are these are issues where um, if there's not progress or if, if things deteriorate more broadly, uh, they will be brought up. Okay, we are over time, for which I apologize. But please join me in thanking our panelists again. Outstanding work. Thank you so much.